Jackie Bloomer, thanks so much for spending some time with us today. Uh, please remind our audience a little bit about who you are and how you came to be involved in space. Sure. Um, so I'm Jackie Bloomer. I uh, teach in a rural school in Greenville, Illinois. I teach sixth grade and I have loved space ever since I watched Apollo 13 um, in college. I walked out and I told my husband, I looked up at the moon, it happened to be a beautiful film um, as we left the end. I tried three times, um, was not accepted by NASA any of those times, uh, but that was okay because I did my very best next thing, um, that, or the very best thing I think I could possibly have done. And that was to finish out my education with, with teaching and then try to inspire the next generation of people who could follow up um, and go to space after. Um, so uh, after that, I, I've been, I've taught first grade, title one, fourth grade, and now I'm at junior high. So I can go into all the other stuff, but well, your story is a lot like Kevin's. I mean, I'm sure that he'll, he'll share that with you if he hasn't already. I mean, like the idea that, you know, you want to go to space in one respect, it doesn't happen that way. So you make it happen in a different way. And that's through inspiring many others who might want to go there. So that's, that's pretty great. Um, tell us a little bit about how you inspire young kids, because I think there's sometimes like a misconception that kids can't really be uh, learning these harder concepts that we might see in space until they're older. And yet, obviously you're starting much younger. So how do you, how do you take a young child and get them interested in these larger concepts? So um, when I taught first grade, a lot of the stuff I did was just really basic, you know, like the solar system, just, I, I literally took my whole classroom. We, at that time I had windows that, that encompassed the whole side of one of my walls and I covered them all in black. We put constellations, um, poked them out so that they could see the different constellations. Um, I, the kids built a spacecraft, um, that we had in the classroom and that became their reading corner. And so they would sit in, in that little spacecraft that I took little light bulbs in, you know, and they could push the light bulbs, <laughs> just very, very basic. Um, and it's really interesting because I also thought, you know, Hey, at the elementary level that how I really change someone's um, or inspire them at that age level. But I actually did. I had a student that came back um, to me after she graduated high school and asked if I would come to her graduation party. And I was like, sure. I didn't realize though that the whole thing was like her writing this letter about thanking me for inspiring her. She was going into the aerospace field. I mean, like talk about being like, you know, to the heart. Um, so that was, that was really, really nice. And she said it was because of doing activities like that. Fantastic. You want to? Well, jump in? <clears throat> yes, I would. Um, first of all, I'm I'm from a rural part of the world, so I understand how much uh, all the challenges that are associated when you live far away from a big metropolitan center, or you live far away from a university or a planetarium or NASA. Right? We're fortunate. We're only two hours from Kennedy Space Center, so we can see rocket contrails. Right? right. Periodically. That's, uh, but I know growing up in the middle of the mountains, what that was like. I want to just throw out, I also applied to NASA three times and I used to feel, um, you know, I used to feel bad about that as a young man, but if you look at the qualifications of who they pick, you, you can't feel too bad because the, the folks that end up being selected are, you know, otherworldly almost in their mm -hmm. accomplishments and you just got to tip your hat and say, uh, you know, you gave it a run, right? But yeah. uh, I do agree that uh, we live in a wonderful age where it's not just nations that are going to space, but it's middle school kids that are doing work that, and they're doing, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities on ISS and uh, we're just glad to, I'm glad I met you through this new cohort. So we maybe can conspire to do even more good than we would have done individually. Sorry, you lagged out there. I got inspired too. Uh, just it, that we'd be inspired to do more together than we will do individually. 100%. Um, that's what I loved so much about LSI. Uh, I was able to meet you at the SEEK conference and that, you know, I, I don't know if you're, if you guys know this, but this year has been just absolutely phenomenal for me. Um, 
being away from Florida and all that kind of stuff, I never thought that I would have the opportunities in the Midwest that I've had this year. Um, and AIAA did that for me. Uh, I was one of the Trailblazer winners last year. And that I think just opened up a ton of doors, right? And so through that, um, I think some of the people with the LSI kind of got my name. I don't know. <laughs> I saw the application and it was just crazy, right? So uh, I am super excited just from SEEK and listening and getting to talk to the people, the other educators that are just like me, right? Like I'm the only one in my district, I feel, that has this passion and drive to teach space education, right? So I feel very isolated sometimes. And, and it was so interesting to listen to people, you know, to talk about their love and, and me looking at them going, oh my gosh, they're just like me, you know? So I'm so excited about that. I can't wait. And I, I hope that we also do get to collaborate and do some things. Um, I just think it's so cool. I think it's important to note, like what you mentioned about being around a community of people that are like you. It's kind of like that for our students, right? And we, we often talk about how there, there's a lack of women in STEM, people of color. So the idea of how we see ourselves as students and when we don't feel that we fit in with our own cohort, sometimes it's harder to maybe not only learn, but just to kind of keep going, right? And yet mm -hmm. it's so important to be able to be reinvigorated. So to go to these conferences, tell me a little bit about, um, you know, obviously you're involved in several organizations. Do you think that that's what separates maybe you from your, your school cohort or even in your county? Maybe they're just not as aware or involved in communities? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think part of, you know, like not being by a center that is launching or not being by NASA, our closest aerospace professional would be Boeing out of St. Louis, right? So we're still an hour from there. So I just, I think that's part of it. Um, it we're very, um, we, we're really working on agriculture and stuff like that because we're, you know, a, a farming community. Um, so this year I'm, I'm I, we, well, let me back up a second. So in 2006, we, we I applied, I took a group of teachers. Um, I came in, I said, I want, NASA had the NASA Explore School pro program going at that time. And so I had gone to space camp and I said, I want to, right for the NASA Explorer School Grant. And so from 2006 um, to 2008, our district was really in it, right? Like we were doing NASA STEM nights and that really before STEM was even talked about that much. And then um, shortly after, after 2008, the, the funding kind of died down and it just kind of did not, it was not as um, prevalent in our school. And so it, it, when you said, you know, you, it, you kind of ebb and flow, right? It, we just didn't do it anymore. And I wasn't in a spot where I could do the STEM stuff that I was doing at that time. Um, so through AIAA, that kind of got me re-energized, right? And and then now it, my whole classroom is all space. It's, even though I teach earth and space, like I'm correlating and combining and trying to, you know, interweave space concepts and, and aerospace concepts in everything that I'm teaching. Um, so, so when you bumped up from elementary to middle school now, was it a big change as far as what you were going to do with your students or did you realize and, and just say, I'm going to take these same lessons that worked with these kids and kind of do this, the same thing. I mean, how, what did you have to change anything for middle school? Yeah, quite a bit, actually. Um, at that time, um, NGSS was starting, uh, those standards were coming out. And so. Uh, we had old curriculum, literally, I think it was like 20 something years old. And so my first year, I didn't even use the book. I just created lessons looking at the new NGSS standards. There were some lessons that we had used at elementary level um, that I did, you know, bring, uh, you know, modified, of course, and brought it up to the, the middle school level. It was interesting because for two years, I taught the same kids that I had in fourth grade. So you know, as I, as I come into the middle school level then, and some of those children, I had three years in a row. So I couldn't really do a lot of the same yeah. um, But you're building concept. relationships, right? And that's yes. really important. Those kids get to know you, you become like a little family and they're willing to be stretched more, I think, when, when you know yeah. them like that. Yes. Um, and some of them, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, you, you go ahead. 
I was going to say some of them, um, I initiated a STEM club in, in the district and then they came another year. So it was, it's really interesting to see. And those are the kids that I look at and go, okay, they're the ones to watch out for because they're going to be the ones that are going to keep pushing the envelope and they're going to get out of their comfort zone and they're going to try things that, you know, they might not have otherwise. Right. I, I, I agree with you totally. One of the things that worked out really well for us and we exploded it during COVID was we had the kids find a topic they love and then write about it. And then we submitted their abstracts to adult conferences and the conferences did not know they were middle school kids. And we had like 90 papers accepted all over the world. And that gave us a reason to go travel. So uh, it sounds like your kids would do just as well, right? If they were writing about things they enjoyed. Um, we felt that was a way to build their um, resumes. Well, right? it does take a lot out. of, I mean, that's kind of where my role comes in. I, you probably don't know much about me. I'm not STEM. I'm English of all things and debate. So my role with working with Kevin and those students is that he would teach them the content and then I would help them prepare to either write or speak about it. And so that really worked well. But I didn't realize as a person who's not in STEM that within the aerospace industry, whatever passion you have, whatever you think you want to do in life, you can actually do within an industry. So that for me was, was uh, an experience alone. So, right. Since you're an elementary now middle school teacher, um, I'll share with you. We often um, aren't, we're often not transparent when we enter competitions because they're for older kids mm -hmm. and uh, we play up a lot. For instance, uh, I don't know if you're, have you heard of uh, Conrad, a spirit of innovation? Um, no. Genes in space, the Mars innovation challenge, um, plant the moon challenge. You being from an agricultural area, uh, these are all competitions and often we have to say, yes, you are 13 for the purpose of this competition because um, that's where their enthusiasm is, right? And it's an external competition which lets them see how good they are against the world when you're in a small school like we are maybe you are uh yeah. sometimes the guppy thinks they're really big in the fishbowl but there's a big ocean full of big sharks out there and it's nice to see where you stand i, I want to elaborate a little bit and, and you've not heard about plant the moon challenge have you nope so wonderful uh, a company that spun out of the university of central florida literally makes simulants like regolith that looks like the lunar highlands and the Martian soil. And what you do is uh, there's a competition that's sponsored by different space grant consortia where you take the simulant and you try to augment it and then grow foods uh, to grow uh, foods that for human consumption. And uh, it is a wonderful opportunity to blend sort of agriculture and space together because eventually you know, we need to condition that soil so that we can grow food. Uh, I, did, I just thought uh, if you have kids that are living in an agriculture community, that might be a cool NASA thing that you can do. And the space grants will literally give you money and provide the supplies if you apply. So huh. I, I just thought I'd throw that out. My kids are having fun because they put some worms, the detritivores to try to break down the simulant. So we augment mm -hmm. it with things like potting soil or manure and, and eggshells and coffee grounds. So there's like 25 cool experiments you could do, uh, you know, also with the different species that, you know, maybe that would be something that kind of lane that your kids might enjoy. Uh, Absolutely. My kids are enjoying it and uh, we're terrible at farming, but uh, <laughs> we're excited about space. So. That's hilarious. Yes, um, I would definitely look into that. Okay. Do you have a good support system at your school? I mean, do you find that like whatever you want to do, if you want to step outside that your administration and the parents support that? Or do you sometimes have some struggles being in a smaller community? Um, so, yeah, I do have a little bit of struggles. Uh, there isn't always administrative support. I mean, I think I think deep down they want to, but, you know, it becomes a financial burden. Right. And finding subs um, this year. I've been very fortunate and I've had quite a lot of, of different opportunities. And we are of course in a sub, sub shortage, like I'm sure many other areas are. And so it becomes kind of difficult. So yeah, I, I do think we do have a little bit of um, 
they, I, I truly believe they want to support as in as much as they can, right? But I think their hands are kind of tight as well. I, I believe I, I believe you would agree with, it's sort of like you want to go and do these good things, but you have to pay a price every time you go on a field trip as far as hyper planning for your absence, uh, learning losses, worrying about the kids. I totally get that. I bet you've also heard this. Your administrator will be fully supportive as long as you can find the funds to do it, right? You have to actually raise your own money to do the good work. And that's like a second job, right? You got your teaching job and then you have all of the uh, internal and external marketing and fundraising associated. And that is, I, I totally get that. That's brutal. It's hard to pull off. It is. But I think if you have a passion for something, um, you push through, right? Like, so for me, I, I'm i going to try to do anything and everything I can. And I'm going to try to work around that because I have that drive to teach those children to push forward, right? And I think when they see us doing that exact same thing, then they're learning from that as well, you know? Right. So just telling them and teaching them, I, I tell them science is all about taking risks, right? And making mistakes. And so keep asking, keep trying. You're going to be told, no, that's okay. It'll help you, you know, drive yeah. forward. Well, I mean, you won the you won the uh, AIAA uh, Trailblazer Award, which, by the way, uh, the year before it was created, um, I won something called the Lifetime Educator Award, but it did not come with cash. So I see <laughs> he talks I, about this all the time. I, I called AIAA and I go, "Hey, where's this check for five thousand dollars?" They go, "Oh no, we that's something new we've started." Uh, so I was a part did of you? I was a part of that old award. Did you go to uh, DC to get your award? I did. And then I, I don't want to like this to come across as bragging, but you know what they did this last year, right? Uh, they gave money to no. the school and to you? They yes, you. But, but then they also flew the five. Well, actually, it was supposed to just be the grand prize winner, which was me, um, to fly uh, to um, Texas to watch the Blue Origin launch. Um, oh of New Shepherd, but the, the Blue Origin was awesome. And Michael Edmonds was like, I think I'm gonna, he whispered to me when he handed me the award, I think I'm gonna ask them all to come. Are you okay with that? And I'm like, absolutely. You know, more, the more that can experience it and, and see stuff like that. Uh-oh, hold on, I sat too long. <laughs> <laughs> the lights went off in your room. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta flail your arms around and just to make it come back on. I did. I have to run to the other side of the room. <laughs> know, Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so he whispered and was like, hey, and I said, absolutely. Right. We want, you know, I feel like all of us in this, in this, and, and maybe other niches too, who are so passionate about something, you want to share it with other people. Right. So it was just so cool. They, they did fly all five of us um, to see the launch. And so it was great, but I'm not trying to like, <laughs> no, well, uh, no, I, I don't believe uh, I'm past that, you know, young people, they're prone to jealousy or whatever, but uh, I, I, I'm in agreement with you. Uh, space may be almost infinite, but the community of aerospace enthusiasts is very small and it's easy to become very connected. And uh, I do believe uh, helping uh, part of your uh, outreach is for educators, not just, you know, I, I want to help educators. I, I made a note here. I should, uh, we should talk about offline sometime about maybe our satellite team doing some Zooms with your classroom because yeah. we, we have kids from university level down to 10 years old. And uh, we have a lot of, I, that would, I think that would be a great way to connect kids of similar interest uh, if that's something we can talk about in the future. 100%. I'm going to go back a little bit to the limitless space and to some of the other organizations that you're in, the AIAA, because I know that um, sometimes finding the kinds of lessons that are applicable, particularly for the younger level, can be can be difficult. Have you found that, like, does limitless provide um, resources and lesson plans the way, like, teacher liaisons do in the AIAA? And are you able to utilize those at the younger level? Or is that an area that we need to work more on? So we are actually meeting this summer to create those and, de and develop yeah. those lessons. So there are 20 of us, I believe, um, right. that are going to be meeting and, and working together to, to develop it. Whole, 
That's our whole job is to create the yeah. content. Well, right? That's great. So you'll be, so I guess what I'm saying though, is like, I know that like your content, Kevin, will be like high school, maybe upper middle school. Are they doing it for K-12? Excellent. Yeah, and I, I believe so. And I think the cool part is even some of the educators that were selected are, aren't necessarily science, right? I think there's an art or music teacher. And so they're really looking at, you know, how to combine all of the, um, all yes. of the subject matters. And, and you may know more than I do, but I thought I read that the goal was to sort of hit the middle school uh, mm -hmm. content first and then scale it up or down, scaffold it up or down for the different age groups. But uh, one idea that I had that I've shared with Casey and, and I'll let you know is I'm going to get my kids to, I'm going to outsource my content that I want to create and let the kids create it. And I think we're leaning towards some graphic novels that would- Oh, that'd be great. That, would, that the kids would create characters that maybe teach each other about these exotic concepts. What do you, what do you think? I think that is an awesome idea. Now, I think I that know. is so cool. I think and the kids I would love it. it. I can't create, I can't draw. I'm a stick figure guy, right? I would be Me a too. stick figure guy. But I know there are great kids out there that love to draw. So mm -hmm. we'll draw in all the artists that could visualize these things. Yeah, and I'm sure you've seen um, LSI has been posting about the Axiom 2 mission uh, artwork that and poetry that they're wanting to fly to space. So that that's going on right now too. The one thing I wanted to say, um, now I I think I lost my train of thought. It was about, about oh yeah, it was about um, you know uh, zoning in on that middle school level because it's interesting as um, an AIAA STEM person going to different conferences, talking to the professionals that are in aerospace, I always ask, at what age did you get excited? Like, when did you, when do you remember first having that, oh, this is what I want to do? And almost always they're saying middle school mm -hmm. and, you know, or a teacher that's close to that level, um, upper high school, because really when you look at the schooling right now, so many of them, you, you need to already have that track in mind, right? Before you hit that high school. Yeah. So yeah, and, I, and I think especially around algebra, right? If you can't get through yep. algebra, you're not going to get through calculus and you're not going to become an engineer or a scientist. Yep. So we've got yep. to get them in that pipeline safely in that pipeline as we can. Are you, yep. uh, are you an officer in your AIAA chapter? This is the K-12 STEM outreach officer for Palm Beach. And I had yeah. that job, but I'm public policy, which is weird because our... Well, because I've done some legislative stuff, again, the debate side, right? But we, nonetheless. We, uh, we find that our section, I, I would like to know about your section, but our section is small. Uh, we have a lot of aerospace in our county, but it's not like we're the Space Coast, right? They're huge. Yeah. Huge. So I am the K-12 for STEM, uh, St. Louis region, and we are considered a large um, section. Uh, so yes, it's it, but I love that she's the policy person he, in no, the I'm stem policy. part so and that's what, no she's no. right i'm yeah. i'm the policy but he has the title yeah you know yes. what I mean? like he um as you 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 mentioned like he he found somebody at the school that was willing to like be part of his he, he calls it like-minded zealots right because nobody else was willing to play so i was like well i'll play i don't know anything about space but i'll play and then all of a sudden it's like now you got to be in, in the aiaa and now you're a yeah. teacher liaison and i'm already going well i'm not a limited with space educator yeah i guess i need to be that <laughs> yeah, you got to find some join us. Yeah, she is a teacher yeah. liaison, Space Foundation teacher but, liaison. Again, just an yeah. <laughs> so I I just got that this year. So I'm going to conference. I don't know anything about it. Oh, oh it's fun. I don't know no. anything about it. So I'm super excited. You're gonna really so, enjoy it. Um, it's like it was pre-COVID. It was like ten thousand people. It's very expensive. I tend to only go when they let me give a talk. Like if I get to present, then I can sort of well, justify. She gets to go for free this year because she just made it. Right, right. And and I imagine I could attend the liaison stuff, but I just want to network in the exhibit hall. You want to spend as much time mm -hmm. in the exhibit hall, take your business <laughs> cards and network, 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 network. You, you, you won't be disappointed at that. Also, uh, before we run out of time, I want to let you know about our conference is at Kennedy Space Center in October. We host our own conference called the Small Sat Education Conference. The website okay. is smallsateducation.org. It is free for educators and students. So uh, I, I think, you know, if you want to start some cookie bake sales, it's time to bring some kids to NASA.
I think you would be, uh, you would make some, in, some very permanent memories in those children if we can, if you can hang out with us at NASA this year. I'm just- Yeah, that, so that's in October? October 28th and 29th. It's uh, all day Saturday, half a day Sunday. If you come to our conference, it's literally inside Kennedy. So you get to be in the park for free. So it saves you $75 yeah. for the ticket. Okay. Yeah, I'll look at that. Well, we really want to thank you so much for giving up some of this planning period. I, I know how precious that, that time is. Um, and, you know, we, we always kind of end with one final question about advice, right? So for those teachers out there who might be struggling to find, you know, their cohort or, or even those students out there who might feel the same way, like I'm kind of stuck out in a place where I don't fit in. What, what advice do you have for those? Um, I would say ask ask, ask, talk to people, communicate. I feel like all almost, no, you're good. Sorry. I feel like almost all of the opportunities that I've had have been because I have been willing to put myself out there and to communicate and not be afraid to ask. The worst thing people can say is no, and you just keep trying. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to talking with you again. Yeah, no problem. Thank you.